Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. This is the next to last encounter of the series organized in collaboration with Centro Pino Levi and with Professor Renato Camuri, who is also uh, uh, one of our guests tonight. And it's dedicated to Franco Modigliani. The last one will be at on uh, 28th um, of this month and, and will be a conversation with two of the most eminent uh, historians of our time, uh, Carlo Ginzburg and Saul Friedlander. Uh, Franco Modigliani, for someone who doesn't know, was an Italian-American economist and the recipient of the 1985 Nobel Prize in Economics. Following the proclamation of the Russian laws in Italy in 1938, Modigliani left the country for Paris together with his uh, girlfriend, Serena Calabi, to join her parents. After briefly returning to Rome to discuss the doctoral thesis at the city's university, he obtained his degree on 22nd of July 1939 and returned to Paris. The same year, the entire, fi the entire family moved to the United States and Modigliani enrolled at the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research. His degree thesis was written under the supervision of Jacob Marschak and Abba Lerner in 1944 and is considered groundbreaking. From 1942 to 1944, Modigliani taught at Columbia University and Bard College as an instructor in economics and statistics in 1946. He became an naturalized citizen of the United States. In 1948, he joined the University of Illinois. From 1922 to, the 90, to 1962, he was a member of the Carnegie Mellon University faculty. And in 1962, he joined the faculty of MIT. Uh, of Franco Modigliani tonight uh, will speak Renato Camurri, as I said before, who is professor of history of contemporary Europe at the University of Verona. In recent years, his research is directed toward the study of the phenomenon of exile and of cultural migration from Europe to the United States in the period between the two world wars. So, the theme of our series. Um, then the, I started uh, for, for his suggestion. Among his most recent works dedicated to this area of research is the volume Franco Modigliani, Risco Italia, Donzelli, 2018. He has also created the volume, the volume uh, Max Ascoli, Antifascist Intellectual and Journalist and the American Lectures of Gaetano Salvemini. is among the founders and coordinators of the annual Gaetano Salvemini Colloquium in Italian History and Culture at Harvard University. He founded and is in charge of the book series Italiani dall'esilio, published by Donzelli. With him, we have Federico Rampini, as being the chief correspondent for, uh, from New York City for one of the Italians major national newspaper, La Repubblica, since 2009, after a five-year stint in Beijing. Prior, uh, prior to that, from 2000-2004, he lived in San Francisco, where he covered the first internet revolution, the so-called new economy. Born in Genoa, Rampini moved to Bruxelles with his family at the age of two, and he returned to Italy in the late teens and started a prolific journalistic career which would eventually take him around the world, covering important international events. In his role as a correspondent from U.S., he has covered several presidential elections and has followed U.S. presidents on their trips abroad, as reported, accredited for the White House. So please enjoy. I think that Renato Camurri is our starting speaker. Okay. Thank you to the Italian Cultural Institute, and uh, thank you to its director for this invitation and for this presentation. Um, my interest in this presentation is not to profile um, the more studied aspect of Modigliani, the Nobel Prize winning economist, 
but to show him as an intellectual public figure was a confrontation with the fascism, marked his character and a subsequent uh, exile. I would also like to underline uh, how the experience of his isle has been de decisive for the transformation of his uh, biographical profile and for the formation of a specific aptitude for the observation of social facts and economic analysis. Um, in other words, the idea is to consider exile as a, an opportunity for a, an intellectual metamorphosis. Uh, to make this uh, journey into the intellectual profile of this uh, figure, I have uh, um, <clears throat> identified four key passages of his biography that I believe can help to understand his experience from fascist Italy to the United States. The first uh, regard the youthful years and the relationship with fascism. I will try to place him personal story within the, the broader path of an entire generation of young Italians born in the year between 1910 and 1920. The second is the choice of the style. The third, the environment of the new school. And the fourth is the anti is anti fascism and the relationship with Gaetano Salvemini. Uh, I remember that from a methodological point of view, these my uh, notes uh, are based on first the consultation of Modigliani's paper in, at Duke University, uh, a long private conversation with Franco and uh, Serena Modigliani, some interviews with uh, his friends and colleagues, among them uh, with Robert Solo and Francesco Giavazzi, and also Modigliani's uh, autobiographical memoir, uh, Adventures for, of an Economist. Um, it's important to remark uh, this, uh, this memoir because auto this kind of material rare among the Italian intellectuals in his eyes. Um, and so uh, it's a, a, a book very important to enter in uh, his uh, biographical profile. Um, the first step, uh, uh, the, title could, the title could be A Young Jew in a Fascist Italy. Uh, Franco Modigliani was born in Rome, 1918. His father was a doctor of socialist sympathies who had also show a clear aversion to the fascist regime. On the other hand, the mother engaged in many welfare and educational activities had a more tolerant attitude uh, toward the fascism regime. He was educated in fascist in Italy during the 30s. He studied at the Liceo Classico Visconti in Rome and in 1935 he uh, enrolled in the Faculty of Law of uh, the University of Rome where he graduated in July 1939, after having spent one year studying abroad in Paris. In his autobiography, Modigliani presents himself as an ordinary student who didn't seem to care much about what happened around him. In the description of his hometown, Rome, there are no references to the politics or the condition of life imposed on Jewish families by the fascist regime. He does, however, report a few incidents that are useful in understanding his desire to be emancipated from fascism and his later activities in anti-fascism. The first interesting uh, incident uh, is the description uh, of a journey abroad. During the summer of 1935, at the end of the high school, Modigliani spent two months in England. In addition to improving his English language, uh, this experience opened his eyes about what was happening in Italy. Um, the young Modigliani was deeply impressed by critical English public opinion about the italo abyssinian War, which resulted in Italian occupation of Ethiopia and it coincided with the rise of popularity of Benito Mussolini. A second important element about his growing awareness of fascism impact concerned his participation in the littoriali. Littoriali were the competition under the regime's control among the top students in Italian university. He was named a winner in 1937 competition held in Naples for his work on price control. Modigliani's narration about uh, this time uh, in his life underlies uh, a decisive intellectual passage. 
He describes the Littoriali as an event in which it was possible to meet, quoted, the best among the young anti-fascists. It is necessary here to point out that the story of his generation is very complex. Uh, the world in which they lived could not be neatly divided into positions such as uh, faithful fascist, critical fascist, and anti-fascist. There was a wide range of positions tied to variable elements deeply shaped by the context of each person's origin, their family in particular, by territorial context, national or local, coming from a big city or, or from periphery, and by cultural experiences. Modigliani's uh, experience is uh, within this generational context, which were the main passage of his course of detachment from fascism and his development of anti-fascism. The Spanish Civil War was a very important event, a turning point, as Modigliani writes in his autobiography, which defined his opposition to the regime. How we arrived to this choice? We have a few elements useful to understand the pass this passage. M Modigliani was centrally in contact with some juvenile groups which had the aim to develop a critical position ab uh, about the fascism and uh, to break the Greek cultural conformism imposed by the regime. The second, it was a juvenile contest in which the borders were flitting and always in movement. Behind this contest, many young Italians uh, accrued their choices. So it was for Franco Modigliani. The next year, Modigliani was a guest particip participant at the 1938 Littoriali in Palermo. A reminiscing about the travel to Palermo, he writes in his autobiography, I quoted, the ferry left from Naples. Uh, on the bridge, I encountered several other students traveling for, for the Littoriali. There was Bruno Zevi and Mario Licata, Gennaro Zampaglione, and others more involved in anti-fascist activity. There was the youngest of the Amendola brothers, Pietro, when I arrived in Palermo, I had no more doubt about my anti-fascism. In the first week um, uh, of September 1938, Modigliani decided to leave from for Paris, in those years the capital of European anti-fascism. Um, <clears throat> At this point, Modigliani most likely had made contact with a uh, uh, youth group of dissident fascists, but he was never actively involved with those groups because he had not developed a political agenda. Rather, Modigliani was a young man in search of freedom, guided by intellectual curiosity, a rebel instinct, and a strong independence. These characteristics uh, emerging in his youth become distinctive characteristics in uh, adulthood. In those early months in Paris, an important private affair consisted with the public experiences. In May 1939, the 21 years old Franco Modigliani married Serena Calabi. The young couple socialized with other Jews who had escaped from Italy. Among them were Salvatore Luria, in 1860 Nobel for Medicine, Tullia Calabi, Dan Zevi, the uh, physicist Bruno Pontecorvo, and Sergio De Benedetti. According to his memoir, uh, while in Paris, Modigliani's relationship with the political dimension remained uh, indefinite, but his anti-fascism erupted on a cultural and moral level. His path is similar to that of the generation of the Italian intellectuals, born between 1910 and 1920, <laughs> who came of political age in the last year of fascism. For this generation of educated Jewish women and men, the search for the redemption from the mis misery of fascism was particularly complicated and then made more difficult by the repression of the race. In the story of Modigliani, we can look upon the meaning of the fate of a whole generation a fate can be summarized in this way, fascism didn't corrupt them. These young Italian intellectuals succeeded despite many contradictions in their de defiance of the contagion of fascist ideology. They possessed a former mentis, an open and cosmopolitan mind with which they could look at the future, 
deconstructing uh, the false myths uh, of uh, over which the regime has built a civil religion and use it as an instrument of hegemon hegemonic control of the Italian society. In other words, they, uh, they were able to substitute, substitute the religion with the thinking, a, qu a quotation from Modigliano autobiography, the th thinking possession of uh, the concrete, the hope for a, the victory of rationality over irrationality. The second step uh, is the, 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 the part of Islam characterized by the experience of Isaiah. Uh, Rome, Paris, New York, the choice of the exile. In August 1939, Modigliani, his wife, and his father-in-law, Giulio Calabi, embarked in the Normandy from the Le Havre to New York. In that moment, Modigliani certainly didn't realize that exile from his homeland would be permanent, nor could he imagine the huge changes about to occur in his life. His escape from Europe and entry into America was carefully prepared. Giulio Calabi helped the young couple organize their li lives in New York City by providing financial support and helping Mondigliani find a job trading books in the city. His autobiography skips references to the problem typically of newly displaced uh, person, the assimilation to a new reality, difficulties with language, the impact of of a new society and the scary to start from uh, zero. An unpublished document found among the Modigliani papers at the Duke University archives uh, point uh, at this uh, foresight, uh, ambition and good luck. His intention to leave Italy actually superseded his marriage to Serena Calabi and his departure from Europe and the academic contrast uh, imposed by the dominant corporatist and autarchic Italian culture. The text from an audio-video interview given by Modigliani in August 1988 to journalist Richard Kaplan, who was working on a project titled The Isle Project, uh, indicates uh, he submitted a series of applications for grants to work in several American universities prior to the academic year 1937-1938. Certainly, that decision was provocated by the Russian laws, but for us, we could also think that Modigliani didn't see a future for a young scholar, such as himself, possessed, possessed by the need to confront serious international scientific debate. This was a very important question. Modigliani, do, during his Paris uh, experience, uh, uh, was able to understand that uh, in Italy there, was, there were, during the fascist regime, the possibility to, to, to study, to, to have a, a very important scientific experience. Uh, the third step uh, is the new school <coughs> and the influence of Jacob Marshak. Another inter interesting part of the Kaplan uh, interview is dedicated to Modigliani's early involvement in the new school of social research in New York City. Only one month after his arrival in America, Modigliani, without any particular planning, became a player in a one of the most important cultural and scientific networks of European intellectual immigration. In Adventure of an Economist, the, the autobiography, Modigliani writes that his admit, admittance to the new school was due to the intervention of Max Ascoli and Paolo Contini. Um, through them, the young Modigliani obtained a tuition free scholarship. Uh, the new school was certainly one of the most important bridges that made uh, the, uh, this phenomenon of cultural Im immigration possible. The new school impact on American culture was extraordinary, particularly in the fields of economy, sociology, and psychology, and social science in general. Also in the Kaplan interview of 1988, um, is the only test in which Modigliani explains, uh, speak about his experience of, uh, at the new school. The first thing uh, he underlines uh, in this interview is the method of working inside the school deeply different, he writes, uh, from the European Organization of, of Higher Studies. In particular, the possibility of having a more personal relationship with the professors and the part a participation in the general seminars. In the interview, also, he stresses the importance of this American educational experience by mentioning the professor he came to know. He quoted the economist Fritz Lehmann, 
<clears throat> the sociologists and Spire, the psychologists are root of Harman, other economists such as Adolf Loeb, Hans Neisser, and Jacob Marshall. He described Marshall, I quote, a, a great economist and a great professor. He took care of me and made me understand how to study economist, economics and how to become an economist. Beyond the scientific and methodological depth of Modigliani to his professor, it's worth it to suggest that Marshak was a model of a particular kind of cosmopolitan intellectuals from whom Modigliani could take inspiration. Uh, some brief note about uh, Marshak, uh, Jacob Marshak. Who was Jacob Marshak? Marshak, born in Zerzi, Russia, crossed into Weimar, Germany. In 1933, he escaped Germany to Oxford, England and then soon after to the United States, where he had a secure a grant from Rockefeller <laughs> Foundation. From the new school, he moved to the University of Chicago, where he directed the Cobles Commissions. He stayed in Chicago until 1955 to live uh, for Yale, and then to the University of California at Los Angeles, where he finished his academic career. Modigliani completed his doctoral degree, a degree in international environment, deeply shaped by an interdisciplinary approach that incorporated the study and analysis of issues concerning the political, economic, and social process, which led to the crisis of democracy and the rise of Nazism and fascism in Europe. There is a direct link from Modigliani to the group of committee refugee scholars who gave voice to the analysis of the new middle class during that period, the labor market and employment, economical planning and fiscal reform, monet monetary problems and problems of agrarian uh, politics. The new school provides a unique environment, Modigliani interest in the concrete dimension of economic uh, processes and for the em empirical dimension of the economist uh, job which include a durable political passion as uh, its roots uh, in how we live during the late 30s and the early uh, 14, the extraordinary laboratory at the new school, uh, nicknamed University Nezai, from which came non-conformist scholars with strong reformist commitments. The last step, anti-fascism and the relationship with Salvemini. During the first years of 1940s, Modigliani began uh, his doctoral thesis at the New School, um, <coughs> which uh, uh, led him to review Keynes's macroeconomic functions. His conclusion resulted in a famous article entitled Liquidity, Preference, and Theory of Interest and Money, published in 1944, one of his masterpieces. The article left uh, a deep mark in the economical debate the, of the following years, a rare phenomenon for the first work of an economist. In those years, Modigliani began to earn in income teaching, which, uh, which allowed him to stop working as a bookseller. In 1942, um, Marshall helped him find his first assignment as instructor of economics and statistics at the new uh, Jersey School for Women. He left that position to teach at Bar College in New York, where he stayed for two years. Uh, beyond that, he had assignments at the new school. It was not uh, an easy period for the young Italian scholar. The choice to abandon his developed book selling business forces him to accept a very heavy burden of low paying in academic jobs. Nonetheless, Modigliani, together with his life, uh, uh, wife Serena, didn't ignore political event that reinforces the, his anti-fascism. He developed the friendship with the Italian anti-fascists in New York, as uh, documented by letters uh, he sent to the American office of Italian Li Italia Libera, the journal of the Partito d'Azione. In addition, he um, befriended many American anti-fascists one was, for example, Varian Fry, uh, who arranged the rescue of some uh, of the most important French and European intellectuals from, uh, from France. Um, <clears throat> Salvemini, um, the relationship with Salvemini. In this period of Modigliani's life, and, um, in this period of, of Modigliani's life, another meaningful relationship involved, that with uh, Gaetano Salvemini, the first trace uh, of correspondences uh, between the, uh, the two men is uh, on September 1944, 
the economists reflected upon the meaning of the war, about the necessity to contribute in the battle against Nazi fascism, and about his double nationality. This letter points out Modigliani's distinctive uh, relationship with politics, which uh, become even more explicit in the post-war era and continued through, uh, throughout his life. For concrete problem, he strives to come up with concrete solutions, not ideological suggestion, first the analysis of dates and after the solution. In his memoir, Modigliani states that uh, his uh, encounter with Salvemini guided him to make precise choices in his civil and political commitments. The two men shared the same pessimistic view about the future of Italy and the necessity to start a moral rebuilding of the civil conscience of the country. In 1946, a few months after the end of the war, Franco and Serena decided it was better to make a home in America than in Italy. The hopes that they had, had put in the season reforms and the moral reconstruction of Italy open with the liberation had quickly broken before the re-emergence of old Italy, that uh, corruption, nepotism, clientelism. Um, in those years and until his death, Modigliani's activities as a public man was marked by seriousness, competence, intransigence, defense of the common good against the particular elite interest. In his work and uh, as teacher and scholar, he possessed a strong moral tension, a taste for provocation, an intellectual curiosity, the, pas the passion for heresy and independence of judgment qualities planted and nurtured in his youthful experiences in Italy and by his experience as an exile. I think that his legacy, his legacy is perfectly summarized in this passage of the Nobel Prize acceptance speech, when, where he, 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 he has spoken, in my life, I never believed in nationalism, in the sense of my country, right or wrong. I was born in Italy, but I left Italy when I felt in conscience that the country behaved in a moral way with the Russian laws and then with the military alliance with Hitler. I renounced the Italian nationality in the black age of fascism when Italy was the symbol of the yoke that weighed on many other countries, even though the Italian conscience had prevented them from doing so with Nazi cruelty but I'm happy to be able to return to feeling Italian today that Italy is a civilized country. I love America, who welcomed me and where I study and thought, but I don't interpret my American being as a, a blind adherence to all that American does. Being faithful to your country means being proud when you are right or criticizing it when it's wrong, so as to bring it closer to the right side. Thank you. So uh, fast forward to the 70s. That's when I have uh, some personal memories about Franco Modigliani that I can talk of. Um, that's when I started my uh, professional career as a journalist in the uh, press of the Italian Communist Party. Uh, end of the 70s. Uh, so that was a period, uh, if you look at the, the big picture, um, worldwide, um, inflationary shock. We had two energy shocks. First one, the Yom Kippur War, 73-74. Second one, the uh, um, Iranian Revolution. Uh, so this added to a context uh, where inflation was already very, very high because of um, uh, social conflict. In Italy, as well as in France, uh, other European countries, you had uh, this uh, explosion of uh, workers' uh, requests for higher salaries, higher wages. So we had a lot of strikes. Uh, labor, labor unions were extremely powerful at that time. And, uh, um, and then, of course, in Italy, there was the, um, uh, also the additional uh, problem, issue, tragedy of uh, terrorism. Black and red, 
We had neo-fascist uh, terrorism and the Red Brigades. Uh, it was a very, very tense, uh, very conflictual time. And uh, at that time in Italy, we had a very uh, a, a special arrangement uh, to protect uh, the purchasing power of workers. Uh, um, indexation of their salaries. We called it uh, scala mobile or contingenza. Uh, basically, um, it was an automatic uh, increase uh, uh, built into the salary system whereby every three months uh, salaries, uh, paychecks would uh, get 80% of the uh, uh, inflation, you know, consumer price uh, index increase. Um, this is uh, th this was a very um, controversial kind of arrangement. It had been agreed upon by uh, the leading industrialists of Italy in those times, Gianni Agnelli, the boss of Fiat, and uh, the number one trade union leader, uh, labor union leader, Luciano Lama, CGL, the communist. Uh, so they, they had agreed to the scala mobile mechanism, the contingenza, this indexation of the salaries, in the hope that this would uh, lead to uh, social peace, that uh, it would decrease the amount of strikes, the labor conflicts. Uh, once you have a, a, an automatic indexation to inflation, maybe you don't need to go on strike very often to get your... Uh, in your paycheck increased. It didn't work. Uh, it didn't work well. Still, uh, Italy continued to have uh, one of the highest uh, uh, social conflicts in Western world, uh, very high percentage of strikes. Uh, so um, that's when Franco Modigliani kicked in uh, with his enormous uh, prestige. He, he was, the, he still is the only Nobel Prize, the only Italian Nobel Prize in economics. So he had a, an aura of prestige, which was enormous. Uh, he was considered as being a socialist or anyway, leftist or progressive. So he could speak to the left uh, in Italy. Um, and, uh, and he started um, intervening in the political debate in Italy with, uh, he, was, he wrote very often on the Corriere della Sera, our competitor, La Repubblica, the other uh, national newspaper. Uh, he gave frequent interviews. Uh, sometimes he traveled to Italy. So, um, and he uh, advocated uh, the end of the Scala Mobile, the end of the indexation of salaries, uh, by explaining that uh, we were, that the Italian economy was getting out of control, that in, governments didn't even control uh, economic policy because uh, the policy was somehow the, the Italian economy was an autopilot uh, because of this crazy indexation it was feeding into inflation instead of uh, you know calming uh, conflicts uh, it was feeding this kind of hyperinflation at some point you know, I remember well because I was covering these issues I was the labor and economic editor of Inashita the weekly magazine of the Communist Party, so my job was to cover strikes, like the, the occupation of Fiat Mirafiori, uh, social conflicts, etc. And, um, and you know, you, we had this this sense that we were becoming kind of Argentina, with no offense for Argentinians, which, by the way, are half Italian. So um, um, we we were becoming the sick. <laughs> the sick economy of Europe with this, uh, at some point, 20% uh, yearly inflation, which is very small compared to Venezuela today, but still, for Europe, it was high. And interest rates also what was trying to, because we had a very high public debt, uh, in order to sell treasury bonds, you had to persuade savers to lend money to the government. So with such a high inflation also, you had interest rates were approximately 20% and above. So that's when Modigliani said, we have to stop. Uh, the scala mobile, the, the indexation is, is wrong. 
and we are on the, on, on the wrong course. Uh, and well, he, this became very, very controversial. He's, because for a number, at least at the beginning, a majority of Italian workers thought that they, their purchasing power was protected by the indexation that in case they lost the indexation, then, then they would be the, the victims of uh, inf high inflation. Um, so this was a very, very heated debate. Uh, so heated that uh, in that particular climate, uh, um, the, the terrorists targeted the people who were trying to change the course of, uh, uh, of things. And uh, the, the maybe in this, Speaking of Modigliani, the, the most illustrious victim was one of his um, beloved uh, uh, students and uh, follower, another econ brilliant, very smart economist, Tarantelli, Ezio Tarantelli, was murdered by the Red Brigades, by Red terrorists, uh, because they wanted revenge against those people who were advocating the end of the Scala Mobile system. But in the end, that, that's what happened. So, um, and th this is what is relevant probably today. Th this is the remark. I, I, I will end with th this reference to uh, present day and uh, uh, what, what's happening today in Italy. Um, I would say that in the, um, in the history of it, the Italian left, uh, that was a turning point. Uh, remember that the Italian Communist Party, although for its policies and its culture was it was already kind of a social democratic party like the german spd or the uh, french social socialists or the labor party in britain but it was still he, th there was that that name communist and there were still links to the soviet union so in order to be accepted uh, and uh, to become a legitimate uh, uh, a political force that could aspire to uh, govern Italy. Uh, the Italian Communist Party wanted to show that uh, it had a sense of responsibility, that it was uh, able to um, to lead Italy into kind of a mainstream of economic policy in Europe, and uh, that, that that's what they did, but with an enormous internal conflicts. At some point, in fact, uh, uh, Enrico Berlinguer, who was the leader of the Italian Communists when I was uh, a journalist in their press, uh, he, 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 um, he took a position against Modigliani and didn't want the abolition of the indexation. Um, when Ber Berlinguer died shortly after, and uh, his successor, Alessandro Natta, at the head of the Italian Communist Party, organized a referendum against uh, the reform of the Scala Mobile, and he lost. So it was a very, very torturous, uh, controversial, uh, conflictual kind of process. But in the end, uh, this is what led the Italian Communist Party to become a, a s really a social democratic party. And this is the beginning of the conversion also to Euro, what I would say, European orthodoxy in terms of economic policies, and that is what is relevant today. Uh, because today, uh, the Italian left is against is again uh, at the opposition in Italy. Uh, what became the Democratic Party of Italy, the heir, the heir to the Communist Party, is now um, a minority uh, political party, and one of the reasons is. Uh, a majority of Italians uh, reproach uh, to the uh, Democrats uh, being too much of a neoliberal party, too much linked uh, to the European orthodoxy, uh, to the Maastricht Treaty, uh, to the very rigid, uh, inflexible kind of fiscal policies that Brussels and Berlin want uh, um, Europe to enforce. So somehow, strangely, this leads to Modigliani. I mean, the, the evolution of uh, the Italian left, or at least its largest party, towards a neoliberal, very orthodox, uh, uh, market-friendly economic policy started pretty much with that debate on the Scala Mobile and with the role of Modigliani. Uh, 
Uh, maybe Modigliani would, would have been, he was a maverick, he was uh, difficult to forecast what he would have said about the, um, uh, the, the later evolution of uh, European economic policies. He was, uh, you know, in terms of, if we use the uh, jargon of uh, academics, he was a neo-Keynesian. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, other, here in the United States, you have at least four Nobel Prizes, neo-Keynesian economists, Paul Krugman, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Kenneth Arrow, Robert Solo, they all hate uh, European rigidity. They all, they're all very, very critical of uh, the Maastricht Treaty, the Stability Pact, uh, you know, this uh, German orthodoxy uh, that doesn't allow Europe to have a flexible uh, fiscal policy. So maybe, maybe if uh, Modigliani would have survived to see the uh, later evolution of Europe, he would have been as critical as his uh, fellow neo-Keynesian uh, economists. Uh, but anyway, uh, today somehow we could argue that the Italian left is paying a heavy, heavy political price because it started its long march toward free market uh, friendly policies and neoliberal, uh, neoliberal uh, orthodoxy, uh, and uh, decades later, uh, this is what made them a minority political force in Italy. Thank you. Well, we can we can add another aspect of interesting uh, of uh, Modigliani biography, um, such as his um, strong interest toward politics. Uh, for for example, uh, during the uh, I remember two two steps uh, very important. Uh, um, the first is uh, the, his uh, consideration toward uh, the president uh, Carlo Giulio Ciampi. Uh, we consider one of the most uh, important figure of uh, political uh, Italian landscape in that uh, phase of very strong crisis. And the second, uh, uh, it was strongly in favor of uh, the, the tentative of a governo, the government directed by Giuliano Amato in order to put in the balance of the, in balance the situation of our economy. So, uh, Modigliani maintained this attention towards the, the, the towards the Italian situation. Uh, he had a strong. Uh, um, he continued to write on the newspaper, not only on you know, the Corriere della Sera, uh, which was his uh, first and most important, probably, uh, <clears throat> cooperation with Italian uh, newspaper. But uh, he also I, he, he had uh, cooperated with many other. Uh, um, news, Italian newspapers, and uh, he was also involved in a, a strong battle against Berlusconi. Uh, quite all, uh, the last part of his activity was dedicated to this sort of personal battle against this man, and uh, the, the model of, uh, uh, that, uh, the model, uh, the, the idea, the value was, uh, Connected with the, the figure of Berlusconi, and uh, I remember some uh, conversation with him. I, I never f found a, a, a man so strongly uh, <laughs> against Berlusconi. It was incredible <laughs> from my point of view. So there is a, a, a link between the this part of, of the, the, the his, uh, his first part of life and the, the end of his life. It's clear the, the connection from my point of view. He died uh, 86. He Sorry? Was, he was young, right? When he died. Uh, 86. Yeah. Not so young. Very young. <laughs> <laughs> but he was still active till uh, the, the, the last, uh, the, the days before his death.
So, yeah, I knew Franco a little bit. And uh, I feel like uh, we, my generation anyway, was lucky to have, um, you know, a, a, uh, a generation of, of Europeans who, and Jew, European Jews, I'm not Jewish myself, but, you know, uh, who got out and uh, Al, Al, the Al Wojnowski is still alive and uh, got out of Vienna at, a, at an early age and uh, um, and not not just a, not only economists but you know a lot of um, European Jews got out and came to the U.S. and I feel like for the economists uh, that they were not comfortable uh, with they never were comfortable in other words. The, uh, the you know stormtroopers could come in tomorrow. You know anything could happen, and you know I feel as though you know we tend to be a little comfortable. Oh, we have a nice democracy. So, sorry, I missed one word. You you said who who could come? Stormtroopers, stormtroopers, right? So you know things could fall apart, and I felt like with Franco and. Wojnarowski and a lot of the other European, especially European Jewish, not just Jewish economists, but a lot of the economists, you know, that the range of, of things that can happen is very wide, much wider than we in our comfort know. And the range of policies, you know, we don't have to do what we're doing now. We could do something quite different. So I, I guess that's a statement, but, you know, I, I guess it's the question would be, you know, what was the effect of that dislocation on Franco and, and other European uh, scholars and economists, you know, that, that tear, being torn out of your comfortable life and being forced to move to a new country and, you know, what, what effect does that have on your thought process? I think that the consequences were incredibly important for the scientific uh, and academic American culture in many different fields of research, and not only uh, economics. Um, we consider this, this uh, wave of uh, cultural immigration the, the, the most important uh, transfer, uh, transfer of culture from Europe to the United States. Uh, so uh, it's uh, if you wanted to concentrate our attention to the Italian case, we can say that Mussolini gift include four Nobel Prize, for for instance, no. Uh, and in, in one is uh, so one is Fermi, physics. Fermi, Segre, Segre physics, Luria, ah, and Luria. medicine in 1869, and uh, and large number of uh, incredible. Uh, T uh, talent in many different, uh, not only scientific, uh, but also uh, it's important to consider uh, artistic, uh, musician, uh, uh, I mean, and also other uh, uh, fields of activities. No, so uh, it's a, a large research uh, to, that uh, we have to complete uh, to rediscover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's we are still we are still exporting. Uh, talents oh, yeah. to the United States right now um, sure. for other reasons. For These other are not reasons. political refugees, yeah. they're economic refugees that we are sending to the US. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your presentations, both of yours. I was just curious, uh, Renato, one thing in the first phase that I'm not sure I understood correctly, you were saying that for the generation of Italian Jews born between 1910 and 1920, they were not corrupted by fascism? What do you mean? It's a very complicated uh, um, situation. In a few words, we can say that uh, uh, currently, in the last 10 years, more or less, the Italian historiography has um, introduced a different kind of analysis regarding this generation of young Italians. In the sense that uh, inside the, uh, it's clear that uh, quite of, of them uh, were educated under fascist uh, directions, uh, but uh, now it's possible to uh, find inside this group uh, many different uh, kind of um, uh, 
tentative to uh, realize by a group of single uh, intellectuals, uh, politicians, to uh, emancipate themselves from the, uh, the regime. So it's a very interesting question. And uh, um, I quoted the experience of Littoriali della Cultura. Uh, Littoriali della Cultura was a, a moment uh, was the, where the, 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 the most uh, educated the group of Italian uh, scholars participated to these activities promote, promoted by the regime. Inside the Littoriali, uh, we can, uh, it's possible to find uh, some figures uh, uh, that try, try to uh, explain a, a critical position uh, towards the regime. And uh, uh, so the, the landscape is different than 20 years ago. So it's possible to find inside the Italian society, inside the university and other sector of uh, public life, uh, uh, a critical position toward the regime. It's clear that uh, only few of them were able to, have, uh, to transform this uh, cultural anti-fascism in a political anti-fascism. You know? That's another kind of passage. But is it a, an opposition to the regime or in, in a certain way is a different way to look at the regime and to pretend uh, to have more revolutionary attitude by the regime? Because um, as I remember for now, a lot of young people in those years, um, before becoming, I don't know, anti-fascist or communist or socialist or something like this, they look at the regime, not look to the possibility of changing the regime to reintroduce the revolutionary uh, spirit of the beginning. Also, if it's not true, but they look at the regime in I, this I way. I think that uh, they, they were not a revolutionary from by this point of view, but another point of view, in the sense that uh, uh, a part of them uh, were able to understood that if you want to, to uh, realize a, a stronger battle against uh, uh, fashion, we have to move the, the battle towards a cultural uh, level. Okay. You know? And so they the model of this generation is, uh, for instance, uh, Leone Ginsburg. Leone Ginsburg, in his analysis of the characteristic of fascism. So we can consider this generation where Modigliani uh, is, uh, gen he was born in 1918. Uh, we, um, Ginsburg was uh, older than, obviously, Modigliani. Um, in, inside of this generation, there is another incredible figure, such as uh, James Pintor, who was uh, 1919, for, for instance. No? Uh, the characteristic of this generation is uh, to think in, uh, to the fashion by another point of view, a new point of view, and uh, trying to realize a, a new project. And thinking to the, a new kind of society and the possibility to uh, uh, to open a, a struggle against the fashion uh, in an, at another different level. So this is the this is the revolution of this group. From I think so. You mentioned Varian Fry earlier. Excuse me. Varian Fry. Varian Fry. Yeah, I was curious. Did he help Varian Fry uh, with? Uh, helping Fry people escape uh, was an uh, incredible figure. He was uh, um, uh, he, he had taught at university. Uh, he was uh, uh, um, historical. Uh, he studied history of art, uh, and uh, he, um, he has direct uh, a, one of the most famous, important uh, mission, uh, a secret mission in the south of France, in order to rescued uh, quite all the group of uh, French artists, uh, surrealist group of French art. And uh, using uh, a strategy and a, a, it was a sort, it was a, a, a secret mission. So, 
And um, Modigliani has a contact that there are, are some letters be, with uh, Varian Fry. I don't know exactly um, the, the link uh, and the connection between um, probably in the New York, uh, probably the, the, the New York uh, anti-fascist uh, networks. Uh, Modigliani uh, has uh, met him as. But it's interesting because uh, it's it confirmed that the, Mo the young Modigliani, it, uh, in that phase of his life, tried to uh, find some connection with this group, with this figure. And, uh, what, what year was he born? Modigliani? Yeah. 1918. Oh, okay. No, wait, no, Bard. 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 From, sorry, from 1942. Till uh, 44, uh, two years more or less, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, regarding Bard College, uh, I didn't quote the, this part of his history. Uh, there is a very interesting group of letters uh, written by some students of Bard to Ward Modigliani regarding the question of the, the participation to the ward. The Second World War, because Modigliani wanted to participate. He offered himself as voluntary, but in the meantime, um, he became a, a born his first uh, son. And so uh, he, uh, he entered in a position. Uh, and uh, um, there is this uh, interesting debate with the scholar, some scholar of the Bard College regarding the meaning of the word and uh, why some young Americans must go to combat in Europe and why himself uh, cannot participate you know, to this experience. Very interesting. Like yeah, he, he participated participate to the Mazzini Society for it. Yeah. And also with Salvemini, he tried to realize some. Um, uh, he helped Salvemini in order to realize a project uh, for the um, realization, organization of a new uh, newspaper after 1945. Um, but uh, the project uh, was impossible to realize th this project. Um, he also had contact with uh, the other group uh, um, born after the division inside the Mazzini Society in 1942. Modigliani decided to stay with Salvemini, Toscanini, and uh, other. Uh, Distinguish uh, Italian uh, anti-fascists. Uh, um, the other, in the other part, there was Ascoli and uh, uh, a, a group of uh, Italian anti-fascists more oriented toward uh, the American um, position regarding the future of Italy. So the, he, he had a, a very important uh, uh, role inside of this this kind of uh, networks. When we mentioned the Nobel Prizes, we forgot Toscanini. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, one question first. Is uh, Mr. Modigliani is related to the painter Modigliani? No, no? OK. That's one thing. The other thing is that <laughs> since you mentioned about Argentina, and because there are a lot of Argentinians, 70%, I believe, is the percentage of Argentinians, you know, in in Argentina of of Argentine <laughs> Italian descend descendants, right? Well, this is just a comment. It's not really anything has about economics because I'm no economist. I'm not really don't know anything about it. It's just as a, probably even a funny comment is that Italy actually cannot live without any of these economic problems which are constantly on and off and on and off. And this is one of the two and the political arena, which are two things. And that's one of the reasons that 
Italy cannot live with one prime minister for a long time, whatever, they have to really change constantly because it's part of their blood. Argentinians, because of that same uh, ancestry, they cannot live without any, without political and economic problems. What happened, <laughs> that's true, and this is what happened with Italy. Well, Italy is, you are artist, you are romantic. You know, you really gave us opera and the painting, Renaissance, Rome, and this is what is more important to you people than to really start putting an order, in order your economic problems. And it's exactly the same thing in Argentina. You know, that's the, Argentinians cannot live, you know, in putting their country really together. They love that. Just a comment. Oh, besides also last question, last thing, is in reality, you know, the communists in, in and you know more than I do, in Argentina, they have not really disappeared totally. As you just mentioned, they, the name of the party changed, but the people still thinking in communist ideology is still there. It's like in the, so in the Russia, the same thing. You know, they're still communists within the system. They all only change the amount of the party, as well as in Mexico, they used to be the PPT, which is Popular Workers' Party, or the Communist Party, but they changed names, and the people who used to run, who are with those ide ideologies, they're still there. And Venezuela is another completely different theme. You know, it's, it's different from all this. Anyway. Just one quick comment about instability. At least, uh, well, Modigliani's uh, objective was uh, attained, and his, uh, the mission to subdue inflation was won. So today, Italy can look uh, still politically unstable, but economically, it's a country with a very low inflation rate. Um, and um, the the price we have paid at least uh, in the last uh, decade uh, is very low growth. So it's a country with the, let's say, um, a, a new kind of equilibrium, uh, very stable prices, but the economic growth is uh, totally unsatisfactory. A question, you know, because we said you know, how important was for American culture that uh, people from Italy and from Europe came and now uh, influenced the, the, the culture and American culture. But at the same time, how do you think that the American experience changed the look of Modigliani toward it? When when he said what he said in the in 70s. Now, do you think that his look was different because of his experience in the US? That's a very interesting question. I, I think I, prob I would probably need a supplement of uh, inquiry, but uh, the first answer that comes to my mind is that cert he was certainly uh, deeply influenced by the United States. Now, let's remember that in that period uh, uh, in the United States, you had, uh, um, well, the, yeah, just before, just before Modigliani entered uh, forcefully the political debate in Italy with his advocating the end of uh, Scala Mobile, uh, in the United States, there had been an experiment uh, of uh, what we call politica dei redditi, which is, uh, uh, and it was under Richard Nixon. So Richard Nixon, um, who was uh, president uh, during the first oil shock, uh, the Yom Kippur War, and uh, had to try to find uh, uh, 
an adaptation or a solution to uh, high inflation here in the US, uh, tried this kind of very neo-Keynesian re regulation, uh, you know, trying to manage at the same time uh, labor uh, unions, uh, um, prices of uh, basic uh, services, uh, tariffs, uh, in order to um, uh, adjust uh, the economy. So this is something that was tried here in the US. Um, and then uh, in the, the whole paradigm uh, changed uh, with Ronald Reagan. So interestingly enough, Richard Nixon, as uh, uh, president for his economic policy, was would be considered a leftist today. He was, yeah, he was for he was in favor of a strong uh, government intervention in regulating wages, prices, profits. Uh, this is kind of a managed. Uh, uh, not really socialist economy, but with, with a strong role for the government. That, that's, that's the environment where Modigliani is uh, elaborating his own idea and his recipes for Italy. With a uh, government that is able to regulate the behavior of the main actors of the economy. Businesses, companies, uh, labor unions, uh, and the public sector. And if a uh, neo-Keynesian was around, uh, what would he recommend? I mean, have the politicians lost autonomy, and is that why they're crying to get out of the EU? I mean, what, what, where, do you, where do you spend the money if you had it? What would you do? Well, that, that's, I, that, that's the, uh, uh, it's not really the topic for tonight, but it's what I, I just, uh, I, I made the uh, kind of a hint uh, when I said that the uh, the four Nobel Prizes of Economics that I can remember of that are living Neo-Keynesians, Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, Robert um, Solo, and Kenneth Arrow are all strongly against uh, European economic policies. So today, um, and somehow the, the actual, the government in charge of Italy today is uh, much more Neo-Keynesian than the traditional left. They are trying to uh, uh, argue against uh, the German orthodoxy and to obtain some kind of flexibility in uh, fiscal policy, public spending. So yes, that, that, that's a very, very actual debate in Italy. Although it's, uh, but my, my, my main criticism of the, the, the Conte government and uh, the two main parties, the Lega and uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, is that they, have been, uh, they haven't been able to organize alliances, a strategy for alliances in Europe, trying to have a wider front of, uh, a wider uh, grouping, group of uh, governments uh, pressuring Germany in order to change the rules. The rules are wrong. Uh, these rules have proved uh, very, very um, uh, nefarious and uh, damaging to uh, prospects of uh, economic growth in Europe. You know, we all had the, the same origin of the crisis. The crisis started here in the US, in New York City, in Wall Street in 2008, 2009. But then the European Union managed to replicate the second crisis, which was totally built in Europe uh, through the European mechanism of uh, very, very tight fiscal policies. Um, and Obama was very critical of uh, Angela Merkel whenever they met in all uh, the summits that I covered as a reporter starting 2009, uh, Pittsburgh, G20. So Obama was a very recent uh, president. And he was very clear in uh, criticizing the fiscal policy of Europe. So yes, there is today uh, a lot of uh, room for uh, relaunching a kind of a neo-Keynesian approach certainly in Europe, and by the way, also in the United States, because of, uh, although here it's always much more 
confusing. Uh, the, um, the tax policy of Donald Trump is very neo-Keynesian. He is uh, uh, increasing the, the fiscal deficit. So he's a leftist in terms of uh, the macroeconomic equilibrium. He doesn't care about the, the budget, you know, reducing the deficit. Uh, it's a, in this sense also, Modigliani probably, and I go back to your question, Modigliani was influenced by a country where, um, which is less ideological. Mm -hmm. the, it's much more pragmatic. The kind of economic uh, policy debate in the United States, uh, you, you can find, sometimes you, you find the Republicans uh, uh, siding with Angela Merkel, and the next time they're more expansionary than uh, any Labour Party or Socialist Party in Europe. Uh, regarding this question, it's important to consider that also Modigliani has a strong influence uh, in, uh, in um, inside the Bank of Italia. It was uh, the mind of the microeconomic model realized uh, in the second part of the 60s inside the, 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 the Bank of Italia. And uh, regarding, uh, do you remember at Harvard the colloquium there, there, were, there were a question uh, more or less uh, re regarding how Modi Modigliani, uh, which kind of position Modigliani could have inside the, the, the currently debate, uh, economic debate. I think that, uh, um, I'm not an economist obviously, but uh, Modigliani probably uh, um, become crazy uh, <laughs> listening uh, some uh, uh, d d d debate in the sense that a large part of this debate uh, uh, didn't have any kind of uh, scientific and uh, uh, structural uh, base. So Modigliani could answer this, uh, that's my opinion. Starting, please, uh, uh, speaking about dates and after we can uh, uh, improve our discussion. No, this is... Uh, <laughs> probably could be as a position, methodological yeah. position. So <laughs> Professor Camuri mentioned Harvard because this is a kind of a Modigliani tour. Uh, so we are, ne ne next, uh, next venue will be Nashville, uh, then uh, New Orleans. Uh, we are going one. on tour. That we are I'm so sorry, so but this is the last So one. thank you to stop at the Institute. <laughs> and thank you, you for participating. <laughs>